singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply going to interviewthefuture.com and making a donation. Today, my guest on the show is Deborah Spar. Deborah was president of Barnard College and is currently the MBA class of 1952 professor of business administration at Harvard Business School and senior associate dean of Harvard, B- Harvard Business School online. Her research focuses on issues of gender and technology, as well as the interplay between technological change and broader social structures. Professor Spar tackles some of these issues in her recent book, Work, Mate, Marry, Love, How Machines Shape Our Human Destiny, which I just finished reading yesterday and is the main reason why we are all here today. So welcome to Singularity FM, Deborah. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So, Deborah, if I were to meet you somewhere at a conference uh, online, or it used to be the case that in the good old days, those were all events that would happen in person. And I would ask you to introduce yourself in your own words in a sentence or two. Who is Deborah Spar? Well, you know, it's it's a surprisingly difficult question for me to answer because I've, I've had sort of a multiplicity of identities over the course of my career. But generally, I would say now I'm a political scientist at Harvard University. Fantastic. Yeah. And it is a very difficult question because I start with that question usually on my podcast. And you'll be shocked to see how many people, amazing, brilliant, smart people kind of really stumble on that question. It really shocks them when I ask them, who are you really? And, and, and then if I push a little back and say something like, okay, but those are inter- your interests. Political science is one of your main interests. But who is really the, the person, Deborah Spar, that has that interest in political science? Well, I, I, in, in, my, in my heart of hearts, I will confess, I think of myself as a writer more than anything else. Um, I think of myself in some ways as a translator. Now, what I think I'm pretty good at is that I can absorb these complicated ideas from academia and translate them and express them for what I hope is a broader audience. And I think that connects all my work more than the, the specific content of any piece of work. So I'm in this, in this uh, most recent book, I'm trying to use the, the past to make predictions about the future. So it's, it's still a long explanation, but I would, I, I, in my heart of hearts, I'm a writer who's trying to explain complicated ideas to a broad audience. Let me take that idea for a second. So taking the past in order to predict the future, that's a thesis though. And it's an arguable thesis, isn't it? Because yes, it makes sense to look at the past as the Chinese proverb says, look at the, at the roots to, to see the fruit or something like that. I'm probably butchering that, but... But uh, there is always a black swan event. There's always something in the future that comes out of nowhere, apparently, and that if we look too close to the past, maybe we'll miss or maybe... No, of course that's right. And, and I always caveat discussions about this book saying, I can't prove anything that's in this book. It's not a scientifically rigorous book. But what I'm looking for are these patterns in the past. And, and there's another proverb, you know, the history, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it usually rhymes, which I think it captures the same idea of what you were saying. I can't explain particular events. Uh, I never would have predicted COVID, although apparently Bill Gates did. But what I think I can <laughs> predict is that we as human beings respond to particular shifts in our environment in predictable ways. So it's not that I can predict a particular event and tell you what the impact is going to be, but but I think there are very strong patterns that lead you to say, huh, when we get a technological change, we will respond in major ways. I can't tell you what the technology is, but I can tell you that as technology changes, we are going to evolve as a species. And it's that evolutionary part that I feel pretty comfortable predicting or at least describing. 
fantastic. And I, I have to say, I enjoyed your book very much, especially the, the parts that were kind of very new to me. For example, making the connection between the plow and the sort of diminished position and status of women. And we're going to come back to that. But before that, I want to dig a little deeper into your background because you said you're a political scientist. I know you had a, a foreign service degree uh, or foreign affairs degree uh, first, and then you did a, a PhD in political science, I think, right? Yes, yes. So, so tell me then, what was your first love? Was it political science? Was it technology? Was it sociology? Because now in your book, you're mixing all of these things. And Absolutely. I just want to see the roots of your personal interest and how perhaps they originated in you. Yes. So my personal interest, and I'm just guessing this may interact a little bit with your personal background, just listening to your to your accent. I wanted to be a, a Soviet uh, political specialist for reasons that I've never understood. I grew up wanting to be a spy. That's what I wanted to be. <laughs> and, and, and for a while, I was very much headed on that course. So I went to Georgetown University. As you mentioned, I have a degree in foreign service. I applied and got into the foreign service. And I was all ready to go. In fact, I had scored very high. So I was there. I was going to go to Poland in 1980, which would have been a fascinating place to be, just as the pressure against the Soviet regime was, was mounting. But it, 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 one of the great ironies of my life, just as I was getting ready to go, the, uh, the U.S. government and its wisdom discovered that I was too young to enter the foreign service. I had gone to college early. And so I had to I had to wait. And so I, I was lucky. I had also gotten into Harvard. So I went to Harvard to get my Ph.D. in Soviet military studies. I started learning Russian, took intensive Russian, became fluent for a while. Wow. Uh, and then when the time came to actually show up in Warsaw, again, another twist, I had uh, fallen in love with the man who's still my husband. Uh, I had become very close to another much older man for whom I was working as a research assistant. And I had started to have a few qualms about entering the foreign service for reasons that aren't important. And so I, I stayed and I became a Soviet specialist. And then just as I was graduating, the Soviet Union fell apart. And so there went my, uh, my research project. Uh, but I had been lucky. I, I had stumbled on a really good research project. And I had been looking at how the Soviet Union operated in international commodity markets. And I became the the kind of global expert on the international diamond cartel. Wow. And so that's where I, that's where I started. And uh, my career has been this interesting zigzag ever since. Uh, sadly, I never became a spy, um, but I do think I still carry that love of really trying to understand places that are distant to me and to kind of tell the story about how pieces fit together. So how does someone who had the dream to become a Matahari uh, end up as the dean of the business school of Harvard of all places like that's and and it like it seems your your background is academically speaking at least in political science it's not even in business so how do you end up doing business that's another twist there yeah, there's a, it's a many many twists and turns and I occasionally I've been giving a lecture these days called the, the joys and occasional frustrations of living a non-linear life which is very much my story <laughs> Um, but, but what happened was I graduated with, with my degree in political science. I was lucky enough to have a number of job offers, and uh, I accepted one at the University of Toronto. Uh, my husband uh, was uh, raised in Toronto, loved the city, and so I decided to leave uh, Harvard and move to Toronto. And then uh, for complicated reasons, my, my husband uh, needed to stay in Boston. And so we were commuting for a year, and it was I had a one-year-old son. And so it was not a, a viable situation. And so I said, I will take whatever job comes up in Boston. And the job that came up in Boston was at the Harvard Business School. So I may be the only person ever who you know, started at Harvard Business School because I was in a commuting marriage. But, but that's the, the kind of flippant view of it, the, the deep view of it. And the reason why it worked so well was, as I said a moment ago, I had spent the early part of my career studying the Soviet Union and studying the Soviet Union's operations in the global commodity markets. And then the Soviet Union collapsed and the communist bloc collapsed. And all of a sudden what had been the communist bloc became the emerging markets. And I knew a lot about that world. And so I became the person at Harvard Business School in the early days 
who wrote the cases on Russia and wrote the cases on China and wrote the cases on Poland and was really looking at the transition that the, the, the former uh, communist bloc was going through. So it, it couldn't have been a better place for me. And it really gave me the opportunity to allow my, my wide ranging interests uh, to range widely. And so I wrote a lot of cases on that part of the world. And then over time really became interested in technology and moved more into, into that set of issues. Wow, the funny part is that I did my undergrad at the University of Toronto. Uh, so wh whereabouts were you there? Which department? I w you may have been my student. I was, it was just a year. I was in the political science department in 1990. Well, I was a few years after that, but okay. yeah, I was in the political science and I knew pretty much everyone. So it was uh, it would have been interesting to, to, to have met you there in person. Yeah. But then you ended up in Harvard, which is, which is uh, very cool. So how do we get then to you having to care about the interplay between technology, gender and social structures? And why should we care about those beyond you? So I've always been obviously a macro person. Most academics are uh, what Isaiah Berlin described as hedgehogs. They go very, very deep into a narrow topic. I've always had wide ranging interests for both better and worse. So, so I spent about 10 years looking at the emerging markets in the formerly communist world. And then I was at Harvard Business School when the internet happened. You know, late 1990s, the Harvard Business School, like many places, was completely convulsed by and obsessed with the internet. And in some strange way, my work on the emerging markets gave me a particular view on the internet. Um, and at the time, it was a very contrarian and very unpopular view. But I wrote my first piece on this was called Ruling the Net, and it led to my book, Ruling the Waves. And what I argued there and argue still, and I would argue that history has now proven me categorically correct, is that the internet, just like Poland or Russia or China, was going to need rules. And particularly it was gonna need property rights. Because again, if you take the, the, the broad view um, and the historical view, what we know is that capitalism doesn't survive unless it has property rights and basic rules of the road. So capitalists, and particularly those who were emerging in Silicon Valley, often like to believe ideologically that everything is better when governments get out of the way and you have no rules. I fundamentally believe that is wrong. And so that was the argument I made in this book, 2001, this 2001 book, uh, which sadly would have been, should have been my big book, but it came out on September 12th, 2001. It was a really bad day to release a book. Um, but at the risk of sounding horribly arrogant, the book was right, and it argued that unless governments put some basic rules of the road in place, the internet was going to become a chaotic and perhaps dangerous space, which I think is exactly what's happened. Um, but that really was my first um, opportunity to look at depth, look in depth at how technologies evolve. And in that book, again, I just I I default to a historical view. I I looked at the internet by going all the way back to the printing press. And I looked at a series of communications technologies and argued that they each had gone through a cycle of evolution, of political evolution. And so that's what really got me into the technology space. Although, as you can tell, I don't work on the sort of the, tech, the technical side of technology. I work on the societal side of technology. But that's very good. And that's the reason why you're here today, because to me, the, the how we do things is an engineering question. You know, engineers can geek about the details about how we do something all day long and they find that fascinating. And I have all the respect for that. But to me as a philosopher, the more important question or a political scientist, the more important question has always been, so what or why? Those are the important questions. So what is to say what happens next? What's, what's the implications and why is like, what's, what's driving this? Why is it happening the way is it happening? So, and, and the how is always to me a secondary question. So, so I have all the respect for, for your approach and the macro view. Uh, and, and by the way, I agree with your thesis to the degree, your 2001 thesis to the degree that, yes, I, I do believe uh, the internet has become very chaotic and unruly and in many ways dangerous environment today. 
Uh, and I agree with you that Silicon Valley wants everything to be laissez-faire all the time, everywhere. And they somehow believe that it would all turn out for the best. You know, rising tide lifts all boats and all that. Uh, <laughs> it sounds good, but it hasn't worked. It just yeah, hasn't. No, not at all. And and actually, if you look at the at the first sort of like dreamers of the, the cyberpunks of the late yeah. 80s and the 90s and how they were hoping and dreaming for the internet, it hasn't turned out like that at all. No, and I, I will say it again, it's the risk of being obnoxious. So I was part of that group at Harvard in the 90s of everybody who was imagining this future. And, you know, because I've just come back to Harvard after some time away, one of the guys I bumped into again, and, and he came up to me, and the first thing he said was, I can't believe that you were right. So I think there is now this reckoning that this beautiful utopia, you know, the, the freedom of cyberspace, just hasn't hasn't worked out that way, and I don't I don't believe it's because of evil intent on anyone's part. I just think again, if you look at history, you could have predicted all of this because if you don't have rules, industry is not going to self regulate. And I learned this in my early research looking at cartels. You can't ask a group of profit maximizing competitors to regulate themselves. It just yeah. doesn't work. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you completely. And I think actually that point on the rules could be potentially a very good point to, for us to discuss towards the end of our conversation today. But before that, we have to build all the details to get there, to get to that point. So let us start first with why this book and why now? So we, we talked about your 2001 book that had the, the misfortune of coming out on the day after September 11th. Why this book and why now? All right, so I'll try and give you the short version of this. But after my Ruling the Waves book came out, um, and despite that horrible moment, I, I was doing a lot of uh, speaking and lecturing about that book. And because that book had a cyclical argument that this, the technology goes through cycles, um, inevitably people would come up to me and say, you know, okay, smarty pants, what's the next technology that's gonna set off this cycle? And I really started thinking about that and, and thinking about my next book project. And, and I thought that the next technology that would have similar set of effects was biotechnology. And so I started looking at biotechnology and this was around 2004, 2005, but I was too early. You know, I think subsequently biotech, you know, is now moving into that phase of being revolutionary, but it wasn't there in 2004, 2005. So I stumbled onto this area of reproductive medicine. And nobody, certainly nobody from Harvard Business School was looking at assisted reproduction. Assisted reproduction was this sort of quiet, vaguely sorted seeming area. <clears throat> and what struck me as a business school professor was that it was the only area of business I'd ever investigated where everybody in it denied that they were actually in business. Everybody was creating forever families but nobody was acknowledging that they were charging $14,000 for an IVF procedure. So I wrote a book on, um, and it is a business and there's nothing wrong with it being a business, but it's a business. So I wrote a book called The Baby Business, which was the first book to really investigate assisted reproduction um, as a field. And I've, I've remained deeply interested in that area ever since, because I think assisted reproduction is probably the most revolutionary technology that we are experiencing right now. I mean, Twitter's a big deal, but let's be honest, it's 140 characters. We, you know, we've had that for a long time. Being able to conceive babies without sex, that's a big deal. So I wrote that book and then I, I left Harvard. I became the president of Barnard College, obviously a hardcore, wonderful feminist place. And so I shifted my research interests appropriately or accordingly, wrote a book on Wonder Women, uh, which looked at what had and hadn't happened to women's lives as a result of feminism. And then when I, when I sort of was able to step back again, I wanted a book that would enable me to pull together some of these disparate strands of my, of my writing life and my research life thus far. And it struck me because I had lived in these multiple worlds that there's a huge literature on technology, which you just alluded to, which tends to be very detailed oriented. It's, it's about building things and breaking things. And with all apologies, it tends to be written by men and has kind of a male feel to it, if you don't mind the, the sort of stereotyping. And then there's this huge literature on gender and family and sex and love. And it's overwhelmingly written by women and has, again, if you'll excuse the stereotyping, a fairly female sensibility to it. 
So I decided to bring those two literatures together, uh, not just to be provocative, although that was probably part of my my uh, motivation, but because more importantly, but I think it's really important that those two literatures are in conversation, because if you believe, as I do, that technology changes the world, then you have to be looking not only at the commercial implications of technological change, you have to be looking at the family implications and the sexual implications and the implications for all aspects of our intimate lives. So I really think this is an important area of overlap, and, and that's what uh, drove the creation of this book. Mm -hmm. Let me challenge you there on one point that technology changes the world. Um, the, the qualification that I'd like to give on this is perhaps sounds something like this. Technology makes things possible, but it is people who make things happen. Yeah, and I would I would definitely agree with that. I mean, the argument I sketch out in the book is is dogmatic by design because it's a big and complex argument. Um, so I'm not so technologically deterministic to say that technology is the driver of everything. Of course, there's a complex causality. You know, I quote Marshall McLuhan: "You know, we make the tools, and then they then they make us." So it's this interweaving of humans and technology. Um, but I think it's crucial that once you, you look at the technology that we humans have created to then look at how those technologies will in turn reshape society. So an obvious one being right now, social media. Yeah. So we created social media, but it has transformed us in fundamental ways. Well, four or five guys from Stanford and thereabouts did, but yes, I accept. There's a couple from Harvard too, but yes. <laughs> Okay, right, right. Okay, yes, yes. Correct. That that's right with the with Facebook it started in Harvard. Yeah. yeah that one, I, I'm that just thinking ours. about the the worst ones, the the Instagrams and and when I say the worst ones, I mean because Instagram as far as I know all the research so far shows like the the most um, impact in terms of uh especially uh teenage girls depression rates and suicides yeah and the fact that the, the more the heavier of a user you are of instagram the better chance that you have to be uh first depressive and eventually possibly suicidal uh yeah. so so that's how i define the worst one here okay so What's your thesis? What's the thesis of your book? You're talking about uh, four four areas: work, mate, marry, love. Uh, you also touch towards the end about death, uh, which is, of course, a very important topic. But is there an overarching thesis? The overarching thesis is more or less what I, what I just described: that as we go through technological revolutions. These revolutions will reshape society in fundamental ways. And in the course of this change will also change our most intimate ways of life. So that things that we think about as being somehow innate to our species, love, marriage, how we form families are in fact artifacts of the, the moment in history in, in which we're living and those moments themselves have been shaped by, by the, it's a Marxist argument in many ways, have been shaped by the means of production. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, and we're going to, to, to get to that, uh, the process of your argument, which is very interesting, I would say, uh, especially for someone who is the, the, the uh, dean at, at Harvard Business School. Actually, you know what? Let's let's go at it now. So you have this kind of a, a Marxist process. So tell us what this is. And how is this even possible? Like Harvard Business School, a Marxist process to write the book or to even uh, look at the world and the major forces uh, and factors that are shaping, as you, as you call, our human destiny? Yeah. So the, the, the important caveat or, or just now, you know, I'm certainly not a Marxist. I don't consider myself a Marxist. I've never been a Marxist. I disagree fundamentally with the, Marxist policies as both Marx laid them out and more importantly, as his followers implemented them across major parts of the world. However, 
If you look at Marx and Engels, who sort of gets overlooked a little bit in history, and if you look at them as historians and social scientists, which is really what they were, they were some of the first thinkers to explore how technology affected society. They were writing during the Industrial Revolution, and they, like all of the best minds of that era, and like many of the best minds of our era, were trying to explain how this revolution was reshaping society. So what they focused upon and what we, we know them for was how the Industrial Revolution was gonna reshape economic class and create the proletariat, all the things that they're known for. But in between those writings, there are lesser known writings where they also look at how the Industrial Revolution was going to reshape family relations. That's particularly a piece that Engels wrote. So that's what I'm taking from them. Um, I'm taking from them, and it, you know, the, the sort of the crude definition or the, the crude description is, um, you know, they were uh, historians of technology and believers in technological determinism to some extent. So I've picked that up, and I, I think it's a really useful frame to use. And uh, interestingly, in the light in light of everything that's happening right now, I I uh, I, I am offering a new course at Harvard Business School this year called Capitalism in the State which includes readings by Marx and Hayek and Polanyi. And, and I put it out there thinking, no one's gonna sign up for this course. It's Harvard Business School, but I'm totally oversubscribed. And I think there is a sense among, particularly the generation that's coming of age right now, even at places like Harvard Business School, that there's something wrong with capitalism. It's not, it's not working. It's not generating what we wanted it to generate. And so are there ways to unpack the system can you reform the system without revolution? So these are these are huge questions, um, but Marx gives us some grounding in them. Yeah, I agree with you completely. So we are, if someone were to blame us to be Marxists, then we are Marxists of the same ilk, which is to say, we accept his diagnosis, we deny his treatment or his, exactly. uh, uh, his way to solve the problem. So he identified the problem extremely well he managed to identify the cause and effect between technology, the, the economic uh, system, and how it impacted on our moral and social system. Uh, but then his solution uh, is, is where we both agree is, is, is failing. Absolutely, uh, yeah, absolutely. So to that degree, at least, we are kind of Marxist. Uh, and I think uh, I also agree that that his major contribution uh, is in that realm, actually, in identifying the problem way early on, like we're talking 1850s, 1860s, yeah. way before anybody else. So that that's that's his greatest accomplishment, in in my opinion. Uh, and and then we further uh, agree on the fact that the claim that the end of history arrived, you know, after the collapse of the uh, uh, Soviet Union, as Francis Fukuyama fa famously said, is patently false. Yes. Uh, and, and that's why the new generation that you're teaching now are hungry for alternatives. And that's why they want to go back to, to, to Hayek, to Marx. And people kind of tend to proliferate on both ends of the spectrum, I think. Many go towards the libertarian end of spectrum. Many are going towards sort of the socialist, communist end of the, the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, so I, I personally think we we need some some new idea, new story. Yeah, no, and I, I would completely agree. I mean, one of the things that's been fascinating to me, I've been putting together this syllabus over the summer, and the great readings, the ones that are still so relevant today are Polanyi and Hayek and, 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 and Marx and, and Keynes. I can't, I'm having a really hard time finding their equivalent in 2020. So we're, we're lacking those giant, those gigantic the thinkers to help us try to understand what's going on right now, which is a little scary. Yeah, I agree, and, and uh, I should have mentioned, of course, that I'm a neo Keynesian more more than anything, if if anything, uh, and especially you mention him in in your book, uh, the economic prospects of our grandchildren is a major kind of futuristic, uh, very kind of ahead of its time piece of of, of forethought that is as uh, you know relevant, probably more relevant today than it ever was before. Yeah, I mean, reading that piece, and, and to your listeners, if people haven't read it, please go out and read it. It's only like five pages long. 
it's not only brilliant, it's eerie because it's written in 1930 and he's talking about the future a hundred years from now, which is right around the corner now. And, and he kind of gets it all right. And I, you know, I get goosebumps every time I read it in terms of just how brilliant he was in seeing where we, where we were going to land. Yeah. Okay. So let's grab each of those topics and go a little bit into depth. We have work, mate, marry, and love. So, and since we're talking the economic uh, prospects of our grandchildren, let's start with work here. Okay. So what is kind of the, the major issues or the major trends that you, with your background, uh, can see today in the world of work? So I think in many ways, these are the easiest to see. Um, and certainly I'm not alone in talking about these issues, but I think it's pretty clear that as we increasingly automate more and more jobs, as artificial intelligence begins to creep into, you know, not only manual labor, but thoughtful labor into the legal profession and the medical profession and heaven forbid the teaching profession, that work as we know it is going to start to disappear. Again, this is what Keynes predicted way back in 1930. And, and for me, the, the most important short-term implication of that is, is unemployment. And particularly, and this is the gender piece, that the jobs that are likely to be lost in greatest amounts and fastest are things like factory work and particularly drivers. And those are jobs that have disproportionately been, been held by men. So I, I mean, we're seeing it now, COVID is accelerating everything. I think we are seeing the short-term prospect of millions and millions of working class men out of jobs. And not only uh, do we have to deal with the economic consequences of that, we have to deal with the societal because we know again, historically that having large numbers of desperate unemployed men pushes you on the, onto the verge of a revolution. And that those men, and it's true to some extent for women, but more, more for men, that because men do not have other identities other than their work, so men tend to define themselves still by their jobs, once those identities are called into question, men don't have anything else to fall back upon. And so we're already seeing it. They fall back instead into these tribal identities, which become very dangerous. Yeah, and, and the effects of that are very dangerous and devastating. And that that is the reason why I try to decouple and, and separate uh, with my first question of all my interviews, the person from their interests. And, and we even had a little discussion with my last interview, um, uh, sort of off the record about that, because... Many people have a tight coupling with their interest. And especially, let's say, if you're an academic and you spent 30 or 40 years in computer science, let's say in artificial intelligence, then you identify that with yourself. The problem with that is, and, and that's particularly true of men, is that first, it's not necessarily true because we are a lot more than that. But the danger is that, let's say you're a soldier or you're a police officer or you're a fireman. And you have done that for 15 or 20 years and you've embraced that as your identity. The problem comes once you get injured. Let's say you go to Iraq or Afghanistan and you get maimed or injured and you can't be a soldier anymore. Then that's not a physical issue. That's an identity crisis. And that's why people get depressed and get suicidal because everything that they think that they know who they are comes originates from the identity of I am a soldier. And the moment that for whatever reason you're unable to continue being a soldier is a moment of existential crisis. And then you start questioning even the reason or the meaning of you going on forward. And that's why people become depressed and suicidal. And that's why I think it's very important for us to, to be able to decouple if possible and keep our identity a little bit separate from our interests. Yeah, and I, I think you're entirely right. And that's what makes me so scared about this, this whole area. And you know, it's, it's interesting what, what feminism has done for women in part is it's given women a multiplicity of identities. Yeah. So women tend to define themselves both by their, their marital status, um, you know, am I fiercely single or am I happily married? They define themselves very importantly by their mother status. You know, do I have kids? Do I have grandkids? 
and by their work. But you know, you can you have more identities and more ways to mix and match your identities as a woman. Whereas for men, even if they're also sort of happily married and happily serving as parents, it's their identity, as you said, as a fireman or a soldier or a lawyer or a journalist that defines them. Um, what I'm about to say is totally non-scientific, but I'm pretty sure this is true. If two men meet each other, one of the first things they tend to ask is, what do you do? Whereas when two women meet each other one of, the, of a certain age, almost always the first question is, do you have kids? <laughs> and, and, and that difference is actually important because when women get unemployed, they have an identity to fall back upon. Men don't. Yeah. And that's particularly true in the context of technology, given that I think five or six million truck drivers just in the United States alone. In Canada, we have like a million and a half, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, which is a lot. And all those people now potentially with self-driving cars and trucks and so on are just one of, of many kinds of sort of professional identities, which used to give people, you know, uh, middle-class standard of living uh, for in, in most, in many cases, people who didn't even have like high school degrees and stuff like that. That's right. And there's, there's not a lot of alternative jobs coming up to take those places, both again, financially, other jobs that would enable people to earn a middle-class living. And also again, in terms of identity that, you know, truck driving is a pretty tough, tough job. It but, is, it, yeah. you know, you're a cowboy of the road, you're, you're a road <laughs> warrior. There's there's a prestige and, a, and an identity that comes with it. And when that's gone, I worry. Yeah. And, and that issue is not an economic issue per se. It's a political issue because we know that many of those people vote as a bloc uh, and, and they often tend to go towards the, 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 the politician whose story is most conducive to their identity and, and who they are and how it fits with, with, with that. Yeah. Uh, so for example, um, you know, uh, my wife is a dual Canadian American citizen. Her mother, my mother-in-law is from Rochester, New York and Rochester used to be known as Kodak city. Uh, and a lot of people there work for Kodak, a hundred thousand people, not to mention, you know, the subsidiaries and, and stuff like that. And once that company went bankrupt and died, people lost very, very, very good, very high paying jobs and lost identity. But that led to not only economic crisis, but now they all tended to, tended to vote politically for Donald Trump. Why? Because he was the only guy whose story made sense to them and had a space for them and who they are as identity, as a background, as and as a dream in terms of where they want to see themselves. They want to see themselves going back in time to where they were. Because Make the America future, great again. I mean, right. that's, that's explicitly what he's doing. Right. So it makes perfect sense for them. Whereas if you're somebody like Hillary Clinton, who is from New York, by the way, and who should have known better, but she never came up with a story that made sense for them. Yeah. So in that sense, it was totally unsurprising that most of my wife's relatives in Rochester voted for Trump. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so that's a political issue. So what do we do then? Then we have this major impact happening. And and before before talking about what do we do, let me take it one step further to the macro level because we're only talking about some vocations and let's talk about all vocations. I think it may have been uh, John Maynard Keynes who coined the term technological unemployment in that article that we discussed. Yes. Uh, so is that a real phenomenon or is it not? Because many people would deny that as a phenomenon even today. They would say yeah. technology creates as much as it destroys. Uh, I do think it's a phenomenon and, and you're gonna, I don't do the, the heavily detailed numerical work here, but all the most of the literature I've read suspects it is very real and it's here to stay. Um, and, and I think it's it's only going to get you know worse or better depending on your perspective because as automation proceeds and as our machines get smarter and smarter it's not just the the Kodak employees and then the truck drivers who are going to be laid laid off uh, it, it's going to go if you will up up the food chain and once again COVID just accelerates it you know if if whoever's going to build the next meat processing plant in the United States and Canada is 
I would imagine, going to make it entirely automated because we've realized that having human beings on, in a meat processing plant is dangerous. And so it will just accelerate that, um, that, that pace of automation. It's not only dangerous, it's unethical, if you ask me. Yeah. But again, I'm a, an ideological vegan, so I'm very, <laughs> very heavily extremist on, on, on meat plants. Yeah. Um, just, just to jump to the what do you do about a piece for a second. Right. Uh, because this is, this is core to what I'm trying to argue in this book, is that I want people at least to understand the causality, or at least consider this as the causality, because what politicians, including Trump and others, have done is they've recognized the job loss, but they're blaming it on other forces. Right. They're blaming it on immigration. Uh, they're blaming it to a lesser degree on bad corporations. And both of those things are, are players in, in the, the overall uh, situation here. But if you see it, as I do, as technologically driven, then you have a very different policy approach. And, and that's why I think it's really important to understand this causality, because if it's technology taking the jobs away, they're not coming back. And putting walls up is not going to get those, bring those jobs back. We need a very different set uh, of policy options. Right. I interviewed uh, Aaron Benanoff, who is a professor of economics uh, and economic history. And he makes a very powerful argument, however, that uh, it is not per se technology, but it is the, the fact that we have a diminished rate of growth of the economy that's more to blame for the for the uh, job losses, uh, because he says we have had uh, change in technology since the beginning of the industrial revolution, but we have always had faster growth, economic growth, which means that let's say we can produce more with the same people, but the demand was even greater. And so that in turn was feeding for even more workers and more workers and more workers. But now in the last 20 years or so, we're reaching a point of stagnation where there's no such economic growth. And therefore, the result is that the demand has nearly collapsed or at best has stayed, uh, has stayed constant. And the result is there's lower demand for uh, workers today. Uh, yeah, I think, these, I think these can both be true. I mean, one of my favorite yeah. words is overdetermined. There can be many causes of, of a single set of phenomena. Uh, but I do think that the, the the technologies that are emerging today are so intensely labor saving that this is a quantum leap. And again, it you know, goes back, you know, Keynes predicted this in 1930, that in the 1920s, you were getting, you're seeing the sort of the final stages of the, the industrial revolution and you had had new jobs created. So the agricultural jobs were gone, but the factory jobs more than replaced them. The problem, and I don't have the data at the tip of my fingers right now, but if you look at some of the unicorn companies today, you know right. Airbnb and yeah. and uh, Slack, and you know they they don't employ anyone. You know their numbers. Uh, you know you look at Instagram Tesla. had eleven people when it got acquired by Facebook, yeah. whereas yeah, Kodak so had hundred and twenty thousand. Yeah. So so comparing a Kodak to a Facebook or a Kodak to an Instagram, I, I think has to make you deeply pessimistic about job creation in the future. Right. So the question then is, let's let's talk about the impact. So we're talking about men and how many men are being pushed out of the 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 traditional workspace and how that's directly impacting their uh, personal identity about who they are, where they're coming from, what they're supposed to be doing in life. You know, they're supposed to be doing the the bread earners, the they have to bring the bacon home and all that stuff. And now they're challenged or in many cases, they used to be able to do it. And in your book, you give examples about, for example, that, that little town, which was the, 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 the world center for washing machines. I think it was, wasn't yes. it? Yeah. Um, and how people, once they lost their very good jobs that they have had for decades, in some cases, they were never able to replace them. So, so what, what is the uh, uh, additional impact of that process on women? How is that, the, the, we, we see how men are being impacted, but what about women? How are they being impacted by this? Well, thus far, in a new way. yeah, women have proven themselves to be more flexible in terms of being retrained um, and going into uh, careers that have some more growth potential. These are not necessarily exciting careers, but uh, 
things like home health aides, nursing, if you go sort of, you know, into the higher paid uh, part of this, pharmacists, these are, these are professions that are expanding um, and women thus far have shown greater flexibility in pivoting and moving into those professions. Uh, the, the downside for women, and particularly in this COVID moment, is women are now bringing home the bacon, uh, which used to be the stereotypical male role, and they're taking care of children, and now they're doing all of the homeschooling because men have not yet moved into picking up more of the, the parenting side, the care side of family life. Although we're starting to see a few little inklings of change coming through COVID or coming as a result of COVID that when everybody's working from home and the kids are there and the parents are there and the dog is there and the mother-in-law may be there, that we're starting to, yes, women are still doing a disproportionate share of all that work, but men are starting to pick up more of it. So I'm vaguely optimistic. Um, about how these shifts might occur. What, what we need to see happen um, is that the cultural icons start to shift as well. So when we see, even in silly things like advertisements, when we see men doing the laundry, they still always look kind of goofy, right? <laughs> They're getting it wrong. They don't understand it. They're tossing footballs around. But we, you know, we need to move into having more normal images of men as parents and as caregivers. And, and interestingly, I think this is where um, gay men are, are really leading the charge. I'm not sure whether it's consciously or not, but in, in creating alternative visions of, of masculinity, that you can have a masculine identity or an identity as a man that's not necessarily or exclusively tied to the breadwinning role. Yeah, you know, I am originally Bulgarian, so I'm very close to, I'm a neighbor of your husband. I know he's originally Greek. Um, so we come from a very kind of macho, uh, heavily, miso I mean, I don't want to, okay, well, very, let's say, macho kind of a yeah. culture. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to say misogynistic, but in some ways it surely is uh, from a female point of view. Uh, but, you know, my wife doesn't do laundry and she's been banned from the kitchen because she does more damage than good. Uh, <laughs> and and most of those things traditionally that women do, I do them at home. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm very heterosexual, but but that has already shifted, at least in my home. And uh, speaking of jobs, by the way, this is what happened. I make my living usually with uh, keynote speaking uh, and... How do you uh, do keynote speaking if there's no more conferences? Uh, and, and now they're shifting online, but people are still not quite ready to pay the way they used to do uh, for previously. So I had my last uh, job at the, in the beginning of February in Panama. Uh, I went to speak there, last paying gig, and then COVID hit. So my business went dead. Uh, my wife luckily has two businesses though. One is a circus company. That business almost dead now too, because again, there's no conferences, there's no weddings, there's no baptisms, it's all been canceled. Um, and luckily for us, she has another business, uh, which is uh, called Arbon, which is kind of health and wellness digital business, and that one is exploding. And so basically she's bringing home the bacon now uh, at home. And and I I've been I've been cooking and and doing the laundry for uh, the last seventeen years already, but now this is kind of the culture shift happening right as it is right here. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think that's happening. I think you're a microcosm of what's happening in millions of families. Um, we just don't sort of sh highlight these shifts as much as we should. I you know I I tend to speak a lot to all women's groups, particularly professional women's groups. And I always get the question of, you know, what can we do to accelerate this shift? And part of my answer, which is a little bit flippant, but is, you know, brag about your stay-at-home husbands. So almost <laughs> every successful professional woman I know has a husband who is doing the laundry and the cooking and the child care because they have to. It's just the math at the end of the day. You, you know, it's very hard to have two people working 80 hours a week, if, especially once there's kids involved. But we all fall into the traps of you know wanting to say oh my husband's a consultant my husband you know works from home or you know he manages the money 
Um, and we should be bragging about saying, yeah, you know, my husband has really taken up all of the home side. He does the cooking. He's a fabulous chef. He does the laundry. But, but you know, even those of us who are, you know, staunchly feminist, we tend to fall into those tropes of somehow pretending that our husbands are still the ones who are, who are out there, you know, hunting and foraging. But, you know, even among women, let me give you a crazy uh, example here, because even for women, this is very strange. So... Imagine on top of those things that I mentioned to you, I'm also a cyclist, which means I shave my legs. So imagine we go to Bulgaria to visit my family for the first time. Uh, and I introduced, we were dating uh, with my wife at the time, that was 16 or 17 years ago. I introduced her to my family. And so uh, I cook, I do the laundry and I shave my legs, which leads one of my aunts to ask another one of my aunts if I'm gay even though I am there introducing my girlfriend to them, simply because from the Bulgarian world point of view of a woman, you know, a, a husband who cooks, who cleans, who, uh, well, my wife cleans, I, I just do the laundry, but, uh, and, and shaves his legs on top of it is only possible if you're gay, even if you have a female right next to you, you know, so this is how weird it is. Yeah, and, but this is also, you know, the, the face of the future that, <laughs> that, no, it is, you know, normalizing, you know, straight Bulgarian cyclists with breadwinning wives. I mean, that has to be part of, of what the future looks like. And that will make it easier for everybody if we can have greater flexibility in, in thinking about both identities and in terms of, of who does which part of what workloads. Well, that's a perfect point for us to migrate to the next part of the discussion here and talk about the other three topics of mating. That's to say probably sex. Everyone wants to talk about sex. Then also marrying and love because we are already kind of discussing those. So where should we begin? Should we start with sex or marriage or love? Well, let's save love for the last. That's, okay. that's kind of the nicest one to end on. Okay. So, yes, everyone always wants to talk about sex, and particularly in the context of this book, Robots, Sex with Robots, which actually the book doesn't talk very much about. Um, but I do argue in the book that the way people structure their sexual lives is changing pretty fundamentally. And again, with the caveat, not for everybody, not all the time. But folks who are coming of age right now, kind of my students, have a very different uh, arc of relationship than I had sort of coming of age in the, in the, in the 1980s. So even in the 1980s, the, the arc was pretty much, you know, you fell in love, then you had sex, and, and you know, then you got married, or maybe you got married and then had sex. But, you know, it was starting to shift even then from the most traditional form. But now young people are are largely finding their partners online. You know, I'm sure your grandparents in a Bulgarian village, you know, you married someone in the village and the you know, parents and a matchmaker were deeply involved. Now people are finding their partners online. And in general, they're looking for sexual partners first. Um, and then if they're both interested, then something sexual can subsequently turn into something romantic. But it's a flip. Of, of what the, nor the old progression used to be. And, you know, I always worry about sounding like that, you know, horrible middle-aged lady who's tisk tisking about how younger people are having sex. Um, and I don't mean to do that, but I, I think it's, it, it is interesting to point out that it's shifting. Um, and, and the shifts are causing some good changes and they're also causing some scary changes. So let's, let's talk about first about how those changes have occurred through history, perhaps, because I find the plow idea very, 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 that's one of the things that I really learned from your book from the very beginning, and I really loved it. And I'm going to take that away and probably steal it for my keynotes eventually. Uh, so let us talk about how those uh, relationships have changed throughout time. Uh, uh, and you, you talk about three ages. Uh, the agrarian revolution pre and after, the industrial revolution pre and after, and then uh, let's say the modern technological revolution starting with let's say the pill and ending to where we are today. So walk us through how that has evolved throughout time because that change you're talking about today is nothing new in the sense that yes, we had change in the 1960s, we had change in the industrial revolution and we had change during the agrarian revolution. So let's start with the plow. 
Yeah. So, and and please, you feel free to steal the idea, but just I hope you know you'll footnote it when when you're back out there on the keynote circle. So the idea here, um, and I should say this was the the original title of this book was The Virgin and the Plow. So it's one of the central arguments in the book. Wow. The editor made the editor made me change it because they couldn't come up with a good cover, um, which is probably the right call. Um, but it's a it's a it's a central argument in, in the book. So if you look across the broad sweep of human history. For most of our time on this planet, we lived as hunters and gatherers. And it is believed by nearly everyone who's looked at this period that the dominant social structure was the tribe. So we didn't have a nuclear family as we think about it now. And people do not believe we had marriage as we think about it now. Instead, we lived in bands of 20 or 30 people. Everybody contributed to the overall economic health of the band, which at that point just meant finding food. Um, children clearly were raised by their mothers or were nursed by their mothers, but they appear to have been raised more collectively. And men, we can presume, didn't necessarily know who their children were. Then the plow happens. So, you know, this was a moment in time that took thousands of years, but slowly in many parts of the world, society shifted from being hunters and gatherers to being farmers. And this was the world's first great technological revolution. And a huge number of things happen as a result. And again, this is quasi-Marxist. One of the first things that happens is that private property occurs. You don't have private property in a hunting gathering society. But once you move to farming, private property is core. You have to know whose land it is, whose seeds it is, whose crops it is. And fundamentally, you need labor. So it's the shift to agriculture that, that raises the economic value of children. And you need children both to farm the land and subsequently to inherit it. And this is where marriage happens because in 8,000 BC, the only way for a man to know who, who his children are is for him to have sex with a certified virgin and to be 100% certain that she never has sex again with anyone else. And thus, without any <laughs> romance, marriage is born. And you know, I, I always have to caveat this by saying I've been very happily married for 35 years. So this is not an argument against marriage. It's just what the history shows us. Marriage was a social contract. And it was a contract designed to protect the sanctity of private property. Um, and as the feminist would say, uh, to preserve the patriarchy. And, and that's, the, that's the origin of marriage. And you can see it still in, in traditional marriage ceremonies. The woman is given away by her father. The white wedding comes from what used to be a test of virginity. And she is pledged to be faithful to him forevermore. Right. So, so then, we, then we have the Industrial Revolution after that. What happened then? The Industrial Revolution doesn't change sex in a fundamental way. What it does change is it changes the division of labor to some extent. Uh, and I won't spend too long here, but basically, you know, it's, it's once you get the creation of a factory economy that men have to go off to work. So I think the Industrial Revolution is most important in terms of setting up that male identity as the breadwinner. It doesn't change sex that much. What fundamentally changes sex is the pill. So the next great technological revolution in changing sexual relations is contraception and particularly the pill. And, and you know, I just wanna underscore that and it goes back to kind of the gendered nature of, of how we think about technology. Many people don't think about the pill as, as a technology, but it is arguably one of the most important technologies of the late 20th century. The pill allows people and particularly women for the first time in history to separate sex from reproduction. And given that sexual and to reproduction- to be in charge of it. I'm sorry? To be in charge of it, to be that decision maker. Well, yeah, it gives women the power to be in charge of their own uh, reproduction. Um, and it just, it separates sex from reproduction in, in just a seismically important way. And it is the ability to control their reproduction that I argue, and many of us argued, that that's what enables women to actually go into the workforce because they can choose not to have children or to have two children rather than seven children. You know, our grandparents couldn't make that choice. Um, so the pill changes sexuality in a fundamental way. We also know, uh, obviously, that it, it, it's what enables uh, women and men 
to have sex outside the boundaries of marriage, and, and we have. <laughs> so, so the you know, the, it's the pill that again begins to change this progression, so that you can have sex first and then uh, marriage later, and then it it leads us up to where we are increasingly now with that online dating, which I don't think is is nearly as important as the pill, um, but is still part of this progression, where increasingly people can now separate their sexual lives from their romantic lives. So for many of my, my students, it's, it's become the norm to have sex very casually. Uh, sadly, and this is the, the downside, you see many people uh, going out of their way to have sex with people they're not particularly interested in, just to have the sex. And, and then they'll, they'll think about structuring their romantic lives later. Right, people just have to make do, I think. It's a terrible, terrible thing to say. Uh, and I, th but the thing is though that, and I, maybe I'm just too old, but I don't think they have to make do. I think they can actually, not only with their partners, whether sexual or lifelong romantic partners with anything in life, I think you don't have to settle. I think you, you can actually stick it out until you find the right person, the right job, the right moment for anything, the, the right, what, what, ha what have you. Right, but, you don't but, have to settle in life. I think, but you're, so with, with all due respect, you're revealing your age here, because what what at least some good chunk of younger people will say to you and have said to me, they don't see this as settling. They see this as an advantage. I always remember one one person saying to me, you know, do people of your age feel really bad that you didn't get to have sex the way we do? So at least for some of them during some period of their lives, they see this as a great advantage that they don't have to mess with the complicate, what they see as the complications of a relationship. There's no weeping, there's no crying, there's no waiting for the person to call you. It's just kind of sex when you need and want it. And a relationship can, can, can come later. But the messiness of the, and, and I totally agree with you, that totally reveals my age and my bias and my, conservatism, if you will, in that way. And I mean, when I was at Singularity University in 2011, um, I was already married for four years with my wife and I spent two and a half months there. And, uh, you know, I had many, and I, I've called myself transhumanist, even though I stopped calling myself transhumanist uh, in the last year or two, but for, for years before that. And some of my friends there in Silicon Valley criticized me vehemently because I was, quote, very old-fashioned being monogamous. Uh, uh, so stub as, as I think Jose Cordero said something towards the extent of like, so stubbornly, old-fashionedly mon monogamous that you're totally out of date. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I don't, you know, again, I've been very happily married for 35 years. Both of my sons were supposed to get married this year. COVID put that aside. But I do think, you know, what we're, we're about to see, and you're, it sounds like, you know, your friends and others are already experiencing it, is that monogamy can be a choice for some people and other things can be choices for other people. Um, so in Absolutely. economic terms, we're disintermediating the bundle. It yeah. used to be that the only way you could get sex was to be in a monogamous relationship, particularly for women. Um, but now there are other options. And I, I think it's that multiplication of, of options that's both liberating um, and also for some people, uh, complicated and sad uh, because the, the down, or one of the downsides of online dating is not everybody gets a date. Um, so if you go back to your Bulgarian village, my husband's you know, Greek village and everyone's original village, everybody kind of got paired off. That's what the matchmakers did. Um, but on Tinder, there's no one who cares whether everybody gets paired off. So some people wind up being much more desirable than others. And so we really have this asymmetry of, of sex that, that I also think is some cause for concern. The winner takes it all, just like in tech. Exactly. In tech, we have big tech monopolies or at least oligopolies. Yeah. The same happens with online dating. A few get the lion's share and many people have nothing. Right, particularly for men, as it turns out, because women are more discriminating. So as I, as I say in the book, it, it, it's proving true that some guys get all the swipes. Right, so, so it seems that 
that technology which many believe is enabling that's to say tinder and all the other dating apps like that grinder that you you talk about in your um in your book uh but they're kind of as hampering to some people as they're liberating to others yes. uh, and i think that's not only in terms of the amount or, or the possibility of having sex but also in terms of the possibility of developing themselves personally as individuals and 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 their characters because you know and you talk well about that in your book uh, the fact that uh people are always on the lookout uh you know even they may have already kind of found a, a serious relationship partner uh, and they may have been in that relationship for a couple of years yet they keep going back to the app and looking at thousands of other options and communicating to dozens and dozens of other people and sort of flirting with them if you will online right uh, and so in other words they're always leaving themselves a plan b they're always interested oh what's out there but to me one of the the reasons why we have such a strong relationship with my wife is the fact that we kind of made each other grow uh, and, and that happened sometimes uh, for me kicking and screaming you know a uh, very stubborn bulgarian macho guy uh, you know Uh, for the last 17 years, my wife had to basically kind of tame me in some ways and, and civilize me in other ways. And in some times she had to kick my ass literally, not literally, but like figuratively. And looking back at it, you know, I may have been kicking and screaming at the time, but that has made me better now. And we both uh, kind of grew together intellectually and spiritually and emotionally. And I think we're better as a couple now but we're also better as individuals. So even as a single unit, I'm better now because of that experience that I had, I was forced to grow. And that also makes me better in social uh, kind of uh, contexts because I'm, I'm willing and able to listen to other points of view and other people and accommodate them and, and, and kind of, instead of being like, so especially the Eastern Euros, we have very kind of cut and dry, straightforward, no BS kind of attitude usually. Yeah. So that I think is kind of lost with, with these. No, I, I think that's right. And that, that is my, my concern here um, that, that when you move to having your relationships online, not only dating relationships, but friend relationships, even family relationships, we all have gotten addicted to the dopamine that that likes get likes provide for us or new links provide for us and so it's really really easy to move back to the temptation of seeing what else is out there where else can I, can i get a little ping of dopamine um and and i do fear that the generation that's coming of age um is not going to build the muscle memory of not only how to build a loving relationship but just how to engage in debate Um, I always recall when I was president of Barnard that the students, you know, various times were protesting various things, but the way they protested was by signing online petitions, which is a pretty easy <laughs> thing to do. Um, and when I would say to them, being old fashioned, you know, why don't you come into my office and let's have a conversation? It, it kind of freaked them out because they, they, they didn't think that was a possibility and they didn't know how to do it because for them kind of the act of protest was just signing an online petition. And, and so I worry about that. And, and I, yeah. I don't want to claim too much for it, but I, but I think it, 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 it's not disconnected to the, the sharp partisanship we're seeing in the United States and elsewhere that people truly don't know how to engage in, in complicated conversations. And I think we're training our brains to swipe left and swipe right way too frequently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and just, I want to highlight sort of three takeaways here. Uh, two directly from your book and one from, from this kind of discussion right now. So the first one comes from your uh, prologue, uh, uh, where you talk about the futures of the past. And the idea, the main idea, again, that I took from there was that it was the plow that gave birth to marriage. And I think to me that that's like, I don't know if I could say revolutionary, but revolutionary to the point that it's the most succinct way that I've ever heard this kind of captured before uh to my knowledge and so i love it and in so in personal sense that was revolutionary for me and how it, how successful it is at capturing that technological change that then leads to a social 
and sexual and relationship or gender uh, power relationship change shift. Uh, then the second one is uh, here. You say that with respect to uh, my old fashionedness that we discussed, that people were criticizing me about. You say in your book that heterosexual monogamy is going to be less and less popular in the future. And, you know, I totally agree with that. Uh, it's just that, you know, call me old fashioned. Maybe uh, I'm, I'm totally out of date, but I am happy with what I have. I'm more than happy with what I have, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> no, and I think that's great. As I said, it's not going, I, I'm not predicting um, that it's going away. I'm just saying it's going to become one choice among many. And we've already seen the growth of same-sex marriage and same-sex relationships, um, which 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 are a huge change societally, um, and a great one. You know that that people who, you know, happen to be born gay can now have the ability to have the same kind of fulfilling relationship that you had you have as a heterosexual man. Um, so I think that's wonderful. And then I think we'll also see, um, you know, people falling into uh, stages of of uh, monogamy, serial monogamy that they're monogamous with one person while they raise children and then they may move on and be monogamous with somebody else. Um, so I think this I think this array of possibilities is really a very good thing, but it doesn't mean that, you know, those of us who, who are in happy uh, monogamous relationships have to change. It just means that we become one option among, among a, a greater range of possibilities. Yeah, but then going to the point that how the younger generation may feel sad for us, you know, I feel sad for them because as you point out in your book, actually the presumption is that all these availability and all those choices and options that they have through the apps would mean more sex, more experience, more relationship. But actually, as we pointed out, the reality that it pans out is rather different. And it ends up that winner takes all, a few get most of the sex or most of the attention, most of the swipes. Uh, and so actually they have less sex than our generation did, or let's say the previous generation, the sexual revolution generation after the invention of the pill, right? When, you know, we had free, the ideas of free love and all that stuff came at that time, 60s and 70s, or maybe late 50s, well, early 60s. Yeah, 60s, yeah. Yeah. So, so in that sense, I think it's a lot harder for them nowadays, even though they don't seem to realize that. Yeah, well, that's okay. I mean, I think if, you know, <laughs> they're happy with their reality and, and you know, not all of them, but but uh, I think there's also, and I don't have data on this, it's just anecdote, you're, you're seeing people being a little bit more uh, for, forthcoming about saying, you know, sex isn't all that important to me. Uh, if you look in places like Japan, it's, it's become so prevalent that they, they have what they call celibacy syndrome which is young people basically saying, we're just not all that interested in sex. They're having some virtual sex with, you know, online uh, entities um, and that's enough for them. And, what and about the incels? I'm sorry? What about the incels? Because, you know, here in Toronto, we had this guy a yeah. few years ago, uh, took a van and you, you talk about that in your book, of course. Yeah. I think he ran like nine people over with his van right in the main street, downtown Toronto. And turned out, you know, in a way he was like a terrorist, but a terrorist of an incel group. That's to say the yeah. no, voluntary think... celibate people. And so they're guys, young men who feel that they're unfairly rubbed out of their right to have sex. Yeah. And as the guy in California that you quote in your book said, you know, it's not, well, how did he say it? I'm paraphrasing. It's basically, it's, a, it's the problem of the female of, uh, of the human species that they're not perceiving him as, as like sexually appealing. It's their problem, not his problem. And, and thus he went on his kind of vengeful right. shooting and I don't, spree. I don't want to legitimize either of those guys or any of the incels because these are clearly deeply disturbed, violent people. Uh, so I don't want to ever be perceived as sort of legitimizing them in any way. But I believe they are the fringe end of, of, of a broader phenomenon. Uh, the anecdote I feel more comfortable with, not, not to deny that the other things didn't happen, is a, a student of mine, you know, lovely, smart, warm guy who is uh, short. And it turns out that being a short man on dating apps really puts you at a disadvantage. 
And, and he was sort of saying he wishes he could go back to the matchmaking days because he would have been matched off in a moment. He's a very attractive guy in, in all senses of the word. But, you know, certain characteristics matter more online. And so, yes, for people like him and then at the fringe element for the incels, um, I think this is something that that is happening. And it's resulted, once again, of many forces, but certainly the dating apps um, and the tinders and grinders of the world have made them worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more, I wonder if announced. being bold is one of those too that actually puts you down because quite frankly I love being bold because it's so <laughs> little maintenance and I couldn't care less you know and I used to have a very long thick hair by the way yeah. uh, but that's long gone and it's I feel I'm better for it but well luckily you're not on tinder anymore so yeah. <laughs> so it all works out I never was there I, I don't even get quite the idea of tinder but <laughs> yeah um, to me, you know, anyway, I'm so old school. It's like totally obsolete. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, so we're talking about the, the sex part and, and should we add anything else about the marriage and the love end of that equation? Well, just, uh, I mean, I think we've covered most of it, but I think, you know, the marriage we've talked about, um, and it's, you know, it's related to, it's clearly to the, to the sex part and to some extent to the work part. Um, but I think marriage is changing in fundamental ways that the, you know, the standard, the monogamous heterosexual, you know, man and woman in, in you know, in a white dress on top of the cake, that, that icon is being blown up into all kinds of pieces. Again, it's not that it's that marriage, the traditional marriage is going to disappear. It's just that it's going to be um, joined by other forms, same sex marriage for sure. Uh, people who have multiple marriages, which we already see, people who are proudly single. There will be some polyamory. I don't think that's going to be dominant, but but I think it'll probably become legal uh, and it will further splinter uh, what's been what's been the archetype of marriage. Um, to, to shift over to love, sort of finally, that's the part where perhaps I'm, I'm strangely optimistic. Um, and maybe even reverse part of my argument a little bit, but I don't think love changes. I, I, you know, I think marriage is a social construct, uh, families are social constructs, but love seems to be hardwired. And that's what makes me deeply optimistic at the end of this. What about the people who say that love is the, the invention of the romantic romanticism period uh, in history and like, the idea even didn't exist like before. I don't know the 14th century, the the troubadours with the, the singing troubadours, and before that, young women were basically married off to. Ah, know. but that's marriage, right? So I'm totally agreeing that marriage was a construct, and the idea. So early stage marriage was was a business transaction. It had nothing to do with love whatsoever. Um, it was later in the the Romantic period, you know, sort of gearing up for the industrial revolution that you start to get this idea that love is even a part of marriage. But I maybe I am just deeply romantic at heart, but I fundamentally believe that love itself has been around forever. It just took very different forms. I think the love that a parent has for their child is hard. It makes sense, right? I'm, I'm a little bit of a sociobiologist, but, but you know, even, God even has wired me, us to Actually, I agree. I agree with you. Actually, I was thinking about this because even looking for an example, the Trojan War, right? That's that's a that's a war about love in the end of the day, right? Yeah. So yeah. so maybe it was rare, but I was thinking because some people have made the argument that the very idea of love was invented during the Romanticism period, but I was thinking, no, actually the Greeks had a lot of stuff to say oh, about and- love. Absolutely. Look at Arrow. I mean, there's there's a god of love in pretty much any narrative tradition. Yeah. And there's there are you know battles that are fought for the love of someone. There's revenge. I mean, love seems to be pretty hardwired into us. The connection between love and marriage is definitely uh, a recent construct. Right. And in in Silicon Valley, uh, especially in the transhumanist community, polyamorous. Uh, relationships have been, I think, the, the the default rule in some circles for a while, at least yeah. for a decade, maybe maybe a lot longer. And there's starting to be um, a couple of court cases and even legislation in the United States and elsewhere that's saying you can have a family unit that is three consenting adults. 
Right. And so I, I think that that array of possibilities is going to keep expanding. Yeah, you were talking about the case in Australia, in front of the Supreme Court in Australia, about the three-parent family there in your book. Yeah. Um, so all of those traditional concepts will change. So can we then justify, if not the incels, the conservative uh, people who, and as it turned out, you know, I am one of those conservatives in so many ways, apparently, even though I consider myself to be a futurist and all that stuff, look at me, I'm like actually very conservative in so many ways, but many people have kind of this intuitive pushback. You know, when I talk to my mother-in-law, she, her answer is why, why she and most of her family voted for Trump is like, well, people's lives are changing and challenged fundamentally in every way possible, right? So people want to naturally, intuitively recoil and fight back. So should we expect that to keep happening? And what can we do to accommodate those people in the new framework? How can yeah. we kind of diminish this clash? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge exactly what you just did, that the future is scary. You know, we, we as a species don't like change. You know, and I know this for both as sort of, you know, my research, but also my role as a manager. Everyone thinks they want change, right? Change is good. But then once we actually realize that change is going to mean something's going to change, we get very scared and we want to revert back to our old ways. And so uh, there's no easy answer here, but I think particularly those of us, I consider myself on the left, having some degree of, of empathy for for people like your mother-in-law and, and her friends, you know, that they're not stupid and they're not bad people. They're they're scared at some at some level. And, and you know, if I can do anything with, with the book, although I know it's a complicated book, is to say, you know, this is the way history moves. And you're you're completely right to feel scared by this because yeah, your your way of life is being uprooted. And we can't go back. Because the other thing history teaches us is, is we don't put these technologies back in the proverbial bottle. And so we need to find ways to take care of people as we're going through these, these shifts. And they're not, they're not easy solutions, but I think, think things like a universal basic income is a really good way to think about it. Realizing that people in Rochester and Newton, Iowa and across the country and across my country are going to have their lives turned topsy-turvy and they're going to feel scared by these things. And so how can we, you know, it seems totally idealistic given where we are politically, but in an ideal world, you would want to be able to not so much slow the pace of change, but address particularly these inequities that are going to emerge as we go through this revolutionary period. Moderate it and perhaps make it more palatable not so shocking and at least not so painful in terms of economic cost, in terms of identity cost, which comes with uh, both uh, UBI, but also education, uh, retraining, uh, and changing sort of the stereotypes uh, of, of personal identity, which are so latched on the, the, the previous jobs that we used to do. Uh, yeah. The idea of masculinity, which is very wrapped up in all this, you know, I am a man, I have to be the bread earner the, and all that stuff. Now, uh, unfortunately, time is advancing here. So we're going to have to move to the epilogue because we're really running out of time. But I just want to mention for the record here that uh, two parts of your book also that are absolutely a must read are the chapter on sex and gender, for example. I found that to be very, very illuminating. And the, the main idea there, and it's called, by the way, Transitions. Uh, absolutely must read. The main thought there, the main point that I took from that was that the line of demarcation between the sexes is not so clear, but rather is very malleable. And there is no such thing as 100% male or female. We are all kind of on a spectrum. And you go through many details, both historical details, but also scientific details, to make that point extremely well. And it was quite a revelation for me to see how some of that research was done in the late 19th and early 20th century. Quite shocking to me uh, and really, really good. So I, I'd say to my audience, guys, check that out for sure. That's a must. Um, 
And so let's talk about the epilogue here and the destiny of humankind. So how do we bring all of those things together and what do they tell us about the destiny of humankind? And again, we're talking about working, mating, marrying and loving. Uh, you have a chapter on uh, defeating death. So how do we, how do those shape our human destiny or do they? <clears throat> well, I think as the, the future rapidly unfolds before us, that an increasing part of that future is going to involve non-human beings. Um, they will be robots, they will be artificially intelligent machines, they will be artificially intelligent avatars, they will be nanobots. Um, these things that on the one hand sound like science fiction, but on the other hand are coming out of Silicon Valley and, and other places around the world. Um, so I do think that we will accept robotic beings in our lives in fundamental ways. And it doesn't mean we're going to start, you know, falling, you know, replacing our spouses with robots. But I do think it means we're already seeing it. You know, our phones know more about our lives than our spouses do. Um, we are using robots to do uh, particularly assistive tasks, helping with the elderly, helping with small children. And so I, this is where I, you know, I am an acolyte of, of Kurzweil, as I am guessing, you know, many of your, your listeners are. Um, I think we are going to be moving on these two parallel and ultimately converging tracks of building smarter and smarter machines and, and, and more and more human-like machines, and we'll be accepting more robotic tools into our own bodies. And at some point, I, you know, our, our species evolves. I don't know when that happens. I don't know what that looks like. Um, but, but I do fundamentally believe that we will not stop it. And I think the progression that Kurzweil first described that, you know, would you have contact lenses? Of course. Would you have hearing aids? Of course. Will you have artificial shoulders? Of course. That progression just continues. But if we are to disentangle a little bit the impact uh, on the genders, which are becoming malleable and, you know, there's a lot more gray area and, and flexible more than ever before, can we even disentangle the impact of that technological change on men and women well, one of the people who I was really struck by in doing this research is a woman named Martine Rothblatt, <clears throat> also Kurtzweilian. Um, Martine is building, is, is deeply in love with her wife and is building a robotic version of her wife who's still alive, um, animated by AI with the hopes that their love affair can remain in perpetuity. I don't know if she'll succeed, probably not, but what's so shocking or so interesting about Martine is Martine used to be Martin. So Martine is transgender. And as she says, if you've already gone through a gender change, but you still believe that yourself, your soul remains unchanged, then it's not that much of a leap to imagine going through a transhumanist change. And some of your soul, however we think of that soul, being carried forth and vested in some other form. Not possible yet. Um, but I think that idea um, is very powerful. And I think at some point in time, I don't believe in my lifetime, we will be able to retain some kind of our identity in a digital format. Yeah, Bina was uh, an interviewee on my podcast. What was it? Maybe nine years ago wow. or so together with Bruce. We actually uh, did that in person. The good old days when we can go and well, do we could do that. In, in but, person. you know, it's funny speaking, speaking of Bina. So when I in the old days of pre-COVID, I when I was making this presentation, I, I had a picture of, of Bina. And of course, you know, she's she's only from the torso up. But at the first time I made this presentation on Zoom, I realized we're all just from the torso up right now. So you could be, you could be a robot and I don't know. <laughs> we could all be actually fake, totally uh, fabricated individuals, right? How yeah. do we know? I mean, we're, we, you and I will probably only ever interact in this format. And yet, you know, we can form a relationship and have a great conversation. And, and yet I only know you from the shoulders up. And this is becoming increasingly the way we're, we're all living our lives. So if you were a smart avatar, I could probably presumably have the same kind of relationship with you. 
Well, I I am very old school, so I I, I totally get that idea. But I am a Socratic and uh, kind of guy, and my my blogging name is Socrates. So I still believe that there's a lot to be gained by being in person, and the the, the old school symposium has a lot to give us and teach us and contribute to us, and and both in terms of transmitting knowledge from one generation to another, giving birth to your own ideas, if you will. But also we can use technology like we are using today. So hopefully we can do both and we don't have to surrender one for the other. No, and just super quickly on that point. So at Harvard Business School, where I teach, everything is done Socratic method. We call it case method, but it's pure Socratic method. Um, And it's the beauty of what we do. So yesterday I was in 10 classes over the course of the day. Each one had 40 kids in it. Um, They were all on Zoom. And did I develop deep personal relationships with those kids? No, but I I had a relationship. I could talk, I could communicate. It was full Socratic method and it was all on Zoom. Yeah, and and that's good because you can reach 10 by 40, 400 students. But you know, when I was at the University of Toronto in the Department of Political Science, there was not one professor who didn't know my first name. Uh, and and vice versa. I knew all of my professors by first name. That's why I ask you, when were you there? Because if you were there, if we were at the same time, there's no way we wouldn't know each other. Right, right. So, so almost impossible. So, uh, and that's what I think we shouldn't, we should try to preserve. We A- should try absolutely. and keep. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, Deborah, we've been talking for about 19 minutes now. What's the kind of, Let me ask you the two classic uh, final questions that I always ask of all my guests on the show. Number one is, where can people find more about you and your work? Thanks. So the best place to go right now is DebraSparSpeaks.com. So it's my name with with no punctuation, DebraSparSpeaks.com. And that will list all of my books and uh, all of the articles. And then also, if you go to my webpage at Harvard Business School, just Google me uh, and you can get some of my more academic work. Fantastic. And once again, for the record, Deborah's new book is called Work, Mate, Mary, Love, How Machines Shape Our Human Destiny. So now that we have that out of the way, what is the best way to wrap up our conversation? 90 minutes. What's the single most important message that you want to send us away with? I think the biggest message for me is for people to understand the importance of looking at technology with the broadest lens. So thinking about technology, not only in terms of its, as you said this earlier, its engineering, its machinery, but thinking of technology as a crucial input to our societies. And therefore for people who are technologists, building your technology with an eye to what its implications are likely to be, And for people who focus more on the political or social aspect of things, not just ignoring technology as, you know, that thing that makes you crazy that I don't want to think about, but realizing that we are all shaped by technology and, and taking that into account in terms of how you vote and how you shape your life. Because if, if you care about society, you have to pay attention to technology. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you and especially about the implications. And that's why my blog and my work has always been one about ethics, uh, because I always ask the question, so what or why instead of how per se. And technology is all about how usually. And and the more important question is always why or so what, right? Yeah. And, and, and this is, by the way, I started doing uh, political science, even though I started in philosophy, because at least in theory, the best way to apply ethics would be in the realm of politics, right? But we know that the world we live in is unfortunately not a perfect world and not not a representation of that kind of uh, great theory. We we can keep hoping. (laughs) Well, or we can keep doing conversations like this and hopefully change the the culture by, by creating both the awareness as well as the demand of people, both out of themselves, but also of politicians who have to be ethically 
uh, educated and and ask the questions about and and also technologists and engineers who are by the way to a great deal the audience of my uh, podcast and who are getting very educated for the last 10 11 years about the implications of technology and I'm sure now are asking those questions more than ever before that's great well Deborah Spart thank you very much for being with us today it's been a great pleasure thank you thank you so much If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 